Awesome. So uh, now to talk to us about uh, Zoom Zero Days and perhaps uh, how not to do vulnerability disclosure, uh, we have Jacob Light or excuse me, Jonathan Lightshoe. Hi, everybody. All right. Test, test. Oh, awesome. Okay. Hi. So my name is Jonathan Lightshoe. Um, that's not working. Cool. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Leitchu. I am a security researcher and I also work at Gradle Inc. Uh, you may be familiar with Gradle. Uh, we are used to build 50% of all the Java applications out there and 99% of all Android apps. And also Ghidra is used as a build system for, uh, yeah. Um, so one of the biggest questions that I get by people in general is why were you looking at Zoom? And <laughs> the answer was because I was curious, because I was looking uh, basically, um, you have this URL, right? And you click on it either in your, your um, email or in your um, calendar invite, right? And it would pop open a web browser, and then that web browser would suddenly launch an application on your local machine. And I was like, okay, how does that chain of events work? And like, what's going on there? Is there some communication from the browser to the server, and that's launching your local machine? Um, so. The answer to that uh, ended up, and, and the other question was, how are they doing this, and how are they doing this securely? And the answer to the second one was, they weren't doing it securely. Um, yeah, right. What, what, like, how does this work? <laughs> um, and so there were some hints of something weird going on. So I, I cracked open the the Chrome Developer Tools and looked through um, and saw what was going on, and I saw these localhost connections to port 19.421, and I'm like, okay, there's something running local on my machine, machine, what is this, right? And there were other further hints about what was going on. I went and decompiled the JavaScript on their site, and, and you know, not decompiled, but like deobfuscated it slightly, and you could see they're making a localhost request, and I'm like, okay, why? And then there was also, like, further, there was this, like, enum-like structure in the code, and I was like, what? what is this? And so what it turned out was you make, what was going on was the, um, the code on their website was making a local host get request to this local server running on your computer, and that server returned an image. And that image um, had dimensions, and the dimensions of that image was, the, was, was what that enum was. So one by one was a success, one by two pixel image was start down. And so I saw this thing about download and I'm like, well, okay, download, I, I, at this point I hadn't found anything about the download. I was just like, there's something about downloading in here. All right, um, but can we get video, right? So I had at this point managed to prove that uh, any website, right? So there, this web server that's running, I could actually put that same code that Zoom was running on my website and launch you into a video call without your permission, right? So, so I was able to get you into a video call and I wasn't able to get you with your video camera enabled, right? So okay, like where, how, how can I do this, right? So yes, you can. So what I ended up finding after I, I got back and, and did a little bit of research was there's actually on when you schedule a meeting you could turn on the participant's video camera. And so in the default setting for Zoom, when you had not changed anything, you just, you installed it on your local machine, the presenter could actually control whether or not your video camera was enabled when you joined that video call. You could disable that, but that had to be something you did explicitly. All right. And so this is what started my private disclosure. Before I found the video thing, I tried reaching out to Zoom and couldn't figure out where the security contact was. I ended up sending a support contact email to get, to get in touch with them. Um, and so this was on March 20, 26, uh, 2819. Um, and on this 27th, uh, I get confirmation of the reception and then um, in informed that like the security person was out of the office and then I offered, uh, I was offered to um, be invited to their bug bounty program, their private bug bounty program. And so this is the policy that I use when I, um, uh, report vulnerabilities publicly, or to, to companies. Um, and so I use Google's 90 day disclosure policy. Um, it's a standard, 90 days is, is a standard in general. Um, and so I have adopted that as what I use because it's, it's a fixed timeline, it makes sure that things get fixed. And some of the reasons behind this is like Google has um, done a lot of research. They've been doing vulnerability disclosure for a long time, right? 
and um, and they have some a lot of data around the research the, the vulnerabilities they've disclosed. And a lot of the time, when they try to do coordinated disclosure, where the vendor controlled the, the release of the vulnerability, it either didn't get fixed or it took up to six months, right? And also, one other piece of data is that a lot of the times there's actually collisions in bug findings where one person finds a bug and somebody else finds a bug around that same time. And we'll see that actually played out as part of this as well. Um, so this was Zoom's disclosure policy. And uh, yeah, so uh, it didn't quite jive with what I had. Um, so I actually chose not to disclose via their um, bug bounty program. I said I'm going to continue my communication via email because I don't agree to the terms of your bug bounty program. And I said I will be going public at the end of 90 days because it's important this gets, becomes public. Also, the bug bounty payout was fairly low for this. It was like 300 to 600 dollars. So it was, eh. yeah, yeah. Um, so I started doing a little bit more digging, and I dug into the web server. It was um, some compiled um, binary. And so I see that there's some download logic built into this. I don't really know quite what's going on here. Um, but I start digging into, and like this, you see that there's um, like this uh, check for like whether or not a URL that you provide is using these different domains. And it seems like, and I couldn't at this time figure this out, that um, there was some way that this web client could download an update or something like that. But one of the domains, zoom.gov, was scheduled to expire in about four days before. Yeah, so if that had expired, yeah. So I ended up reporting this to the Chrome and the Mozilla team. Um, the Chrome team said this is not a bug. It's like, so the, the reason I reported to them is I didn't think that a browser should allow a website to communicate with a local host server. Like that seemed kind of wrong. Um, and apparently there's uh, a CORS policy that, or uh, sorry, a CORS change that is uh, RFC 1918 that is in the works to fix this, to kind of segregate um, local traffic, like stuff that's in your local internet versus like stuff that's out there. But currently, and like to make it so that if something want, like a website wants to make a request to a local resource inside of your intranet, um, that the browser would prompt you. But that's not implemented currently. And basically, both the browsers would have to go forward with this. And there have been other exploits against this sort of thing with cores. Um, Trend Micro had a, a Node.js server in 2016 that listened for remote commands. And you could also use it to, this was a Trend Micro server they were using for their password manager. So you could also steal all the person's passwords. And then similarly, somebody else found in JetBrains IDEs, PyCharm, IntelliJ, all these different IDEs, there was actually a web server in there that allowed for remote, uh, remote code execution and local file extraction. So this, this vulnerability had happened before. I didn't know about these prior to all this. Um, I actually only found about the JetBrains one yesterday. So, um, so I moved forward with my public disclosure. Uh, so, um, Walking the timeline forward. So uh, I ended up reporting it to the Mozilla team. And the Mozilla team um, ended up closing it as not a bug. And it actually accidentally went public with it. And I went, whoa, hold on. This is not public yet. And so they closed it back down. I told them who it was. And uh, they ended up reopening it as an internal security vulnerability against their internal infrastructure because they were users of Zoom. <laughs> And they were the reason that I ended up in a video call with Zoom because they were already going to have a chat with them. Um, so I ended up in a call with them, and, and we get on the call with this, them, some salespeople, and the salesperson basically is saying, oh, yeah, we will totally, like, we'll have this fixed. We, and I told them about the, the, the DNS registry expiration. They, they fixed that within 24 hours. Um, and they said, oh, yeah, we will totally have this done by 90 days, right? Like, and then I didn't hear much. Um, so um, the public disclosure deadline arrives. Um, I'm starting a new job with a new company. They're flying me out somewhere to start that new job. And it's the final week. And I'm sending them emails the past two weeks saying, yo, where is the fix? Where's the patch? Come on. Like, I want to test this. I want to make sure this is fixed. Like, we're getting close to the end of the 90 day disclosure. So I get the fix. Uh, what was it? Uh, I get the fix like three days before the end of the 90-day disclosure window. And I'm like, uh, so I don't really have the time to, f to test this, but it does seem to fix my POC. But come on, like, 
we had 90 days, I would have been happy to work with you within 90 days. Um, and basically, the, the, what I said to them is, if I, I'm, gonna, I'm still going to write this up. I'm still going to publish it. If I publish this, uh, and I, and I, or if I'm working on this and I find a bypass, I'm going public 24 hours. Because you guys needed to have worked with me like during the 90-day period to make sure this was resolved. You can't give it to me at the like final hour of the 90-day disclosure window. Um, so then my own life gets in the way. I'm starting a new job. Um, it actually takes me another 14 days to sit down and write the article, and I sit down and write it over the 4th of July weekend. And I look, and that volume was fixed, right? Nope. That, I can just put Zoom's website in an iframe, and I can hide that iframe on my site, and now I've launched into a video call. Same old way, right? I report this to them, and their response is, well, that's a different vulnerability. And I'm like, no, this is the same vulnerability. I'm just I'm exploiting it differently. Um, and so, like, you look, the number of Macs that are vulnerable is like over 4 million Macs, right? 10% of uh, the PC market, like, Macs are 10% of the PC market, and, like, given the number of users, potential users of Mac, um, like 4 million users, or 40 million users, it's a good estimate of how many Macs are vulnerable to this, right? Um, so what about that download logic? What happens when I uninstall Zoom from my computer, right? So take that app file, drag it to trash. It reinstalls itself. What? <laughs> right? Like, OK, so um, yeah, so ooh, wrong way. So I ended up going public with this. I, I give them a little bit of time. I say, look, I'm going public. They're like, can you give me an extra three hours? Sure, fine. You can have an extra three hours. <laughs> I go public. Um, and the first people that contact me, inter interestingly enough, are BuzzFeed. Of all the news organizations, it was not the first organization to reach out to me, but they did some solid reporting, so props to them. And you know, um, and I, in this video, in this uh, write-up, I had a proof of concept link. I had a link that said, "Here is a proof of concept that will show you this vulnerability. Warning: If you click this link, you will like be joined to a video call that, without you expecting it." Um, uh, and. People started joining this video call. I was just sitting there in this video call. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty wild. Um, yeah. Uh, so I spent three days in this video call. Uh, uh, so yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> Um, so the first, like, the, over the first like 24 hours, we end up with a constant like 60 to 100 people in this video call throughout the like, and and so I get like three hours of sleep that night between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. and I'm getting like news reporters contacting me. It was, I did not expect this to get as big as it did. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're running like uh, like here's how to fix it. We told people about that like web server because the web server. When you uninstalled Zoom, that web server was installed in your home directory under a hidden directory. So it wasn't in, right? So if you uninstalled Zoom, that web server stayed behind. Um, and so, yeah, so I actually, there were, across three days, there were over 1,300 people joined. And I created this, like, everybody's photo got downloaded on my local machine. So I created this collage of, <laughs> of everybody's faces who had joined across the third, the, the, yeah, because their avatars get downloaded to your local machine. Um, <laughs> So Zoom's initial response was, it's not a vulnerability. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, this kind of speaks for itself. Um, uh, when asked whether or not, like, the I, about the iframe, right, they responded that, no, this is not a concern. Um, uh, yeah, the fundamental security vulnerability here is that it was a feature, right? Like, and, and that was actually, so part of that is, right, like, when, when, when your core company, like the thing that you are selling is like one click to join, right? Like that's a really hard thing for a company to kind of recognize that the thing that is your core selling point might itself be a vulnerability. And, and so that was what Zoom was running into here. Um, and so the question was, okay, what about Windows? Actually, Windows was vulnerable as well if you happen to check this button where it says always allow types of links to be, uh, so the web server wasn't there but you were still similarly vulnerable. Um, and this is about uh, URL protocol handlers and how they get handled by browsers. You'll see that that changed later. Um, so yeah, so uh, at, uh, so I released it on Monday at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Tuesday, the CEO of Zoom joins the call. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, like a fourteen billion dollar company joins the. Actually, they had their IPO during my uh, during my uh, disclosure call. During that, like while I was waiting, yeah, like they had their IPO like two weeks before I disclosed this. Um, so yeah, so he joins the call, and actually he does something really cool. He he comes and says, you know what? You're right. We screwed up, and um, they said they would fix the vulnerability. Um, they would uh, remove the daemon, the daemon server. They would, um, one of the other things we found as we were doing this, thank you, uh, is they would get rid of the, uh, the encrypted chat, or they, they would encrypt the chat, which it wasn't encrypted before. Um, they would have a public bug bounty program, which they've done, and they would increase their bug bounty payouts, which they've also done. So they've all done all of these things since then. Um, and Apple actually had to step in and remove that web server from everybody's computers, um, which ended up being really important. And Zoom actually fixed it too. They added this new dialog that you've probably seen if you've used Zoom since then. Uh, yeah, but there was a remote code execution vulnerability. So I'm sitting on Wednesday listening to Risky Business, and he mentions on Risky Business, by the way, that researcher, he missed a remote code execution vulnerability. I missed what? <laughs> So, so yeah, there, there actually was a, a Zoom, a, a remote code execution vulnerability that AssetNote found. Um, and it was because of this has suffix check. And so instead of just checking the domain directly, they were checking the suffix. And so if you passed it that, where you had .zoom.us at the very end, you could supply your own domain and you could get the, the client, you could get your own code downloaded and running on the local machine. And so there's actually... This little proof of concept they they put up, where you go to the domain. Yeah, and there's the calculator in the background. Yep. <laughs> yep. Not mine. Them. They they get they get credit for that one. Um, I missed it because um, I'm not that good at binary decompilation. Um, but yeah. Uh, so it was really good that Apple step uh, that Apple stepped in. And then I had to reach out and contact Apple because of this little one. Uh, Zoom had. Uh, 14 white labels of their software. So all of these software were actually Zoom under the hood, and they were all similarly vulnerable. So this is Ring Central, Telus Meeting, BT Cloud Phone, AT&T Video Meeting, BizConf, who, who, like all these companies, Zahumu, which is like all these different companies were also all running Zoom with a rebranded, renamed thing. And Apple had to step in and remove all of these web servers and from everybody's computers as well. So what about Zoom now? They do a public program. They have a staging area for jumping into a meeting. Um, and they've ramped up their security stance significantly. And I can't quite say the details of that, but I know from experience and having chat with people, they are doing a really good job in that space. And browsers also, you'll notice, got rid of that checkbox that says, always allow this URL to get opened. Um, kind of, Firefox. Uh, well, that was. Last I checked, like three months ago, I haven't actually checked this again, so uh, maybe they've changed that. Um, so some closing thoughts on this. Um, had I not gone public, uh, Apple wouldn't have stepped in and fixed this remote code execution vulnerability on 4 million Macs, right? Like, that, that's the long and short of it. Also, we ended up finding out, similarly, AssetNote found that vulnerability four days after I reported the original vulnerability to Zoom. So there were, were actually people looking at that same chunk of code around the same time, and we can only imagine that there are probably other people looking at it that may have been nefarious, right? Asset Note's a good company. They do security research. I report vulnerabilities publicly. Um, so there is a really important component here around disclosing vulnerabilities in things that get shipped to customers, things that customers actually use. Um, and so... Uh, that, that's kind of my final thought on this. Is I, I really believe in public disclosure. It's an important part of this ecosystem. Also, people learn from this sort of stuff. They learn about vulnerabilities. They learn about things to look for. So, um, yeah. Thanks. That's me. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, go for it. What? Oh yeah, I got the T-shirt. I got a backpack, and I did get a bug bounty out of it at the long, at the long term, which was really nice. So yeah. That was my question. <laughs> it was. It was. It was quite a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get it. <laughs> oh, this is great. 
Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, firstly, I think that's great that you're helping to get this company to help improve their bug bounty program. I was curious, as someone who works and does vulnerability reports like this, um, you mentioned a few times things like had they worked with me or had they responded. You know, I guess two questions. One, um, were you emailing them and they were just like not working with you? Or um, when, like, had they kind of communicated with you and said, we just need a few more days or here's our hold back, would you have worked with them or stuck to your 90-day yeah, policy? Yeah, so kind of. So, that, like, the Google disclosure also kind of has a 14-day just like policy in there. If the, if, the, if the company says that they're going to have it done 14 days, after the, the end of the 90-day disclosure, like usually if they're working on it and like you can see that they're fixing it and they're giving you a, a response back and saying, here, try this out, like no, it doesn't work, like that, that kind of dynamic, right, totally fine, give them an extra 14 days to fix it, right? But if they're like, if it, if they say they're going to have it done, they're going to have it done, they're going to have it done, and, and, and the feedback is they're not giving you like, here, like we've, we've fixed this, right, like, and here, try this, you, you feel like they're not actually engaging with you and working with you. And, um, and it's really important that, that you're not, you're communicating with the researcher that there are steps being taken. So there was communication going on, but a lot of the communication was, we'll have a fix out for you, we'll have a fix out for you, we'll have a fix out for you, and no actual actions that actually show that they were actually fixing it in any sort of timeline. You'll notice that fix that they had um, for the, the pop-up like window, I think that was out in uh, a week. Right, they had that done in a week. So when, when a company thinks that things that security is important, they can get things done really, really fast. Yeah. All right. All right, fine. All right. All right, thanks everybody.